If you have a Bible with you today, I want to invite you to open up to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. This is going to be the last week that we are in this passage here. Today we are finishing up our series that is called Out of the Cave. We have spent the last month talking about the idea of mental health. All right? Because if you have a brain, you have mental health. All right? And so we've been talking about mental health and just how, how important this subject is for people. And really, um, I, I think it's, it's so important, but it's also a topic that can easily isolate people when you don't talk about it. Someone walks in and they feel like that's something they're struggling with and no one else is talking about it. And, and what happens is ultimately you feel completely alone in that, um, which just really sends you down a di- downward spiral of making things even worse. So our goal uh, is to begin to have a healthier understanding of our mental health, uh, to be willing to be open and talk about it, to have the resources, to find the help that we need, uh, and to move to a spot where our mental health does not stop us from living the full life that God wants for us, and for us to have a complete relationship with our family, with our friends, our church family, our Creator, and our Savior. Because that may sound very simplistic, but the reality is there have been seasons even in my life where my mental health has, has stood in between me and many of those relationships. And so we, we wanted to just kind of focus on this. And so I want this. Let's press in one more time with this topic as we wrap this up today. Let's make sure we aren't missing anything that God wants to speak to us. Let's be open to wherever we maybe need to grow today. Uh, so if you are willing, if you are able, would you stand with me? Uh, and I want to read our passage for today. Uh, we are moving into the second half of the story. We have not really looked at this part of the story. We spent the first three weeks in the first half of it. All right, so this is the story of Elijah as him and God now interact with each other. So this will be on the screen here. Uh, So we are in 1 Kings 19, starting in verse number 8. So he got up, this is Elijah, and ate and drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord, God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Let's pray. God, I pray that uh, as we have gone through this subject, as we've gone through this story of Elijah and your interaction with him, uh, Lord, that, that we just would be challenged today. God, that we would maybe see this story in a new light. If we've read this story many times before, if it's the first time we've heard it, God, that something new would be illuminated uh, that that you just kind of bring to the forefront for each one of us. God, whatever it is that we need to be working on, that you would speak that to us today. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, you can can have a seat. We have talked uh, throughout this story. There have been several things that have contributed to Elijah's poor state of mental health as we have walked through this. Okay, so so far, we have talked about uh, fear and isolation. The first week, Elijah is afraid of this situation with Jezebel, and he takes off running, and that fear just dominates his mind. It's not just being afraid of someone trying to kill you. It is something that sticks with him. And then from there, as he runs, uh, isolation, he leaves his servant behind, and then he, he travels further, and basically the, the person that probably could speak life and encouragement into him, he abandons him, goes on by himself, isolates himself in this situation. And then we talked about comparison. We see this prayer where Elijah says, God, just kill me. I just want to die. I'm no better than my ancestors. And he begins to compare his life to his ancestors uh, and what that does to us mentally. And then we see 
the first time that there is a spiritual moment that kind of encounters Elijah in this story is God sends a messenger. God sends an angel to speak to Elijah. And that angel says, get up and eat. And he goes back to sleep and he says, get up and eat again. And basically what this is showing us here is God cares about like our physical well-being. And that at times when our physical health is beginning to deteriorate, that it is absolutely going to impact our mental health. Okay, like we all know this. If you didn't sleep well last night, if you slept wrong and your neck is hurting you, it is much harder for you to focus right now. Right? Like our physical health, our physical well-being impacts our mental health. But we have one last one today. I previously said that there was two, but uh, really as I was diving into this and writing this, I feel like uh, they, they really are, are one, and one just kind of creates the other. The other is a, an outcome or a symptom of it. So the, mass, the last thing contributing to Elijah's mental health in this passage that we see is something that we are going to call rumination. Rumination. Okay, and that might be a new word for you. Uh, if you are a dairy farmer, it probably is not a new word for you. Okay? You might be like, what? Why is that? Okay, there are two different definitions for the word uh, rumination that are listed in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Okay, the first one is this. The act or process of regurgitating and chewing again previously swallowed food. Okay, I'm going to assume that most of us do not fall into that category. This is, this is animals that fall into a class that is a rumination class of animals. Okay, you have cows, uh, and then there's a few others, sheep, deer, things like that. Okay, cows do that. They, they chew it, swallow it, bring it back up, chew it, different things. The second definition of rumination, obsessive thinking about an idea, situation, or choice, especially when it interferes with the normal mental functioning. So we are talking about the second definition of the idea of thoughts playing over and over in our heads, specifically negative thoughts. But quickly, I, I do want to talk about the first definition because I actually think this is a great, uh, it's a great analogy, a great visual for us uh, in some of this, okay? So basically, like I said, this is cattle, sheep, deer, uh, and, and they do this to, to properly digest their food. What, what happens is, um, and, and this is kind of a gross visual, okay, and I want that. Embrace the grossness this morning, okay? They chew their food enough to moisten it, and then they swallow it where it mixes with some of their digestive acids, okay, in one of their four stomachs. And so then it kind of mixes, and then basically they bring the food back up, and they chew more on this, Okay, uh, and this is obviously like a, a good thing for cows. Like they, they chew on it and then they're going to swallow it. Now this is, this is absolutely disgusting in my mind. Okay, uh, as I ate this morning, at no point was I thinking, this would be, you know what, that food was good. I wonder if it would be as good a second time. Maybe I should bring that up and try it. Okay, if you've ever, I mean, those of you who have maybe thrown up a little bit in your mouth, you're never like, that was a great experience. I should do that more. Okay, like, that, it's just not where we're at. And I want this gross visual of this coming back up and being chewed and, and swallowed and all of this. Now, it's good for cows. It's, it's thought that because most animals who ruminate, you know, when you, when you classify them as either fight or flight, they are flight. So one of the thoughts is, is that this basically came about because, essentially, they could run out into a field, eat all the grass they could as they're looking, okay, where's the predators at? And as soon as they see one, they're like, okay, everybody run! And they take off running, and they don't even have to digest the food in that moment. And then later on, when they are safe and away from a predator, then they can bring the food back up, and they can chew it more and digest it more, okay? Some of you guys are like, I, I kind of do that. Like, I go into the kitchen late at night, and I try to not let anybody else see me grabbing that snack at midnight. And they hit the light. What are you doing out there? Nothing. <laughs> you know, and so this idea, though, of like this rumination, it coming back up and, and what's happening there. Um, so I think this is, this is gross for us, but, but I, think, I think that that gross visual helps because when we are thinking negative thoughts in our life and we allow that to kind of saturate our mind and, and we process it, like think, and, and then we begin to stuff it down how often do we then regurgitate these, these terrible thoughts and, and allow them to come back and sit on our mind? Like, we should be as disgusted with that thought 
as we are with food coming back up into our mouth and us chewing it again. And yet, how often do we do this? How often does a side comment that someone makes stick with us and we think about it and think about it and think about it? I, I tell the story of when I was in third grade. I, I've said this to a lot of you before. I remember a kid made a comment on the school bus to me about my teeth. I had gotten my adult two front teeth and I already have larger adult teeth. But when they were next to the baby teeth, oh boy. All right, it was it was quite drastic. And I remember a kid making a comment about that. And I was, I want to say I was, I was married and like in ministry and, and probably 23, 24 when I actually started to process the fact that that was still impacting me because every time I went to smile for a picture, I basically was trying to manipulate my smile in a way where my teeth would not be as visible and would not look large or anything like that. Like those thoughts that stuck with me for so long. All right, so that definition, obsessive thinking about an idea, situation, or choice, especially when it interferes with normal mental functioning, and especially when it's negative. Now for cows, they do this because when they bring it back up, there's still nutritional value in that food. So they keep going over it, and they, and they chew it, and they chew it, and then when the nutritional value is finally gone, they swallow it, and it moves in to the rest of the digestive system. Now I will say, there is some value at times in us recalling a thought, a situation, something that has happened, for us to reflect on it and say, okay, God, what, what did I do here? Did I, do, did I handle this situation wrong? Did I handle it correctly? What can I learn from that? Uh, did, did what someone said to me, maybe there was some truth in that, and I should maybe kind of take that to heart, but then when the nutritional value of that thought is gone, we need to push that away. But instead, we allow it to keep coming back, keep coming back, when all, oh, thank you, Siri, when, when all value is gone in that thought, we let it keep coming back. I want us to look at what, what is happening with Elijah and why, why this is impacting him and why this term rumination, I think, is, is pretty valid with what's going on. So Elijah has traveled. He is in a cave. And God begins to speak to him. And God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, quick little lesson. Uh, does the God of the universe, the creator of everything, need to ask us questions because he doesn't know the answer? No. He, he knows the answer. The reality is that whenever God asks a person a question... If he asks you a question in your life, or as we look through scripture, like think about it. What is happening there? Okay, go back to Adam and Eve. And they sin and they're hiding in the garden. And God says, hey, where are you? Do you think God actually doesn't know where they are? No, in that moment, he doesn't need an answer. What's happening is, is, is he wants to give an opportunity for the person that he's talking to to basically have a confession moment. That, that, that's what's going on. He's not looking for an answer. He's looking for a confession. Then Cain kills Abel, and, and, and God says, Hey, Cain, where's your brother? See, he doesn't need to know where his brother is. He knows where he is. He's giving Cain an opportunity for a confession, for a moment for him to kind of take a step back and say, All right, I, I need to process the fact that God's asking me this question. There's probably something in that for me. So Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. So here's, here's the first reason why I think that Elijah is ruminating on some negative thoughts and allowing this to impact him. Okay? Uh, he does something here that we should catch, but often we miss. Uh, is Elijah's answer to God truthful? No, it isn't. Elijah is stretching the truth here. He is exaggerating. Now, exaggeration was going to be my second thing that impacts us, but really what I see here is when we ruminate, that often leads to exaggeration. Okay? Uh, he, he goes into all these awful things that are happening around him, and he says that they have killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. Well, that, that just isn't true. In 1 Kings 18... Right before the whole showdown with the prophets of Baal, uh, th there's a guy, Obadiah, 
who follows the Lord. And Jezebel's trying to kill all the prophets of God. And Obadiah takes a hundred prophets and breaks them into two groups and hides them in two caves. So you know that there's at least a hundred other prophets that are, that are hidden away and being kept safe. And then a little bit, a couple verses after this, God says there are 7,000 people that have not bowed down to the prophet of Baal. So right there, we see 7,100 7, people beyond Elijah. But Elijah is sitting there and he's saying, I'm the only one. They've killed everybody else. I'm the only one that's left. And, and he's exaggerating this claim. Most of the time, stories don't jump from being truthful to a big exaggeration right away. It happens over time. Like usually each time you tell a story or each time you think about a thought, uh, it may change slightly from the last time. It's like the game of telephone. It doesn't just jump right away. Okay, think of a fish story. Like if you go out and you're fishing and you catch a fish and, and you have, you know, basically like a, uh, an 18-inch walleye. You're like, okay, it's a, it's a decent fish. Okay, the next time you tell the story, you're not like, I caught a 28-inch walleye. It was this big. No, what happens? Well, you tell the story, and each time, your hands just get a little further apart, a little further apart, a little further apart, right? And then eventually, over time, you have exaggerated this. So with Elijah here, he's exaggerating this claim. I don't think that this is because this is the first time he's thinking about this. I think he's been processing this. Now, again, I could be wrong. This is me looking at this and kind of speaking into it, which is, can be a dangerous thing as a pastor when you do that with Scripture. But I think what we see here would show us that he has been ruminating on this. All right? Um, now, Elijah responds to God, and then, then he has this famous encounter with God. Okay, so verse 11. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. Okay, then we have the earthquake, and the Lord's not in the earthquake. And then we have fire, and the Lord's not in fire. And then we have the sound of a gentle whisper. And Elijah walks out to the edge of the cave at that moment. And God says again, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he has to ask the question a second time after this big encounter that he has with God. Now something for us to understand here is this. God can handle our hurt, our unhealthiness, and even our anger and frustration. When Elijah is exaggerating his situation... Uh, when he's making a bunch of dumb decisions that are sending him into a downward spiral, God's response is not, well, hey, Elijah, you've made your bed, now sleep in it. Okay? Uh, God is right there for him. He is patient. He is gentle with Elijah. If you go and read through the book of Psalms, it is filled with moments where David and other authors are pouring their hearts out to God. Sometimes even just yelling at God and saying, where are you? Why isn't this going the way I think it should? I want to read Psalm 13 quickly, okay? Like, if you've ever felt uh, that you've had to put a mask on and pretend that things are good to interact with God, I want you to read this, okay? This is King David's approach to God. So this is just six verses here. Psalm 13. How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. I, I love passages like this. It, it shows us and reminds us God can handle our emotions. He can handle our frustration and anger. We don't need to hide that from him. Just come honestly to God. And in the end, the situation for David hadn't really changed. It wasn't like in the middle of him writing this psalm, all of a sudden everything changed. And he's like, great, now I can add a happy ending to it. No, David, in this moment, as he processes honestly with God, as he brings everything to God and just kind of shouts this out, he falls back on this truth that he knows to be evident in his life. Despite all of this, despite me feeling like you're not there, that all these things are going wrong, God, you're faithful. You're faithful and I trust you. And Elijah comes honestly and God draws near to Elijah. And the way he does is such a, such a healthy uh, and healing thing for Elijah, even if Elijah doesn't realize it. 
I remember Elijah's last interaction with God is this amazing fire from heaven being sent down and burning up the altar, the sacrifice, everything that was on it. This amazing like encounter. Can you imagine praying in a moment that something would be burned in front of you and fire literally falls from the sky, burns everything up. And then you pray and it hasn't rained for three and a half years and all of a sudden a cloud just begins to come across the ocean and it rains. Like this is his last encounter with God. It is this big crazy encounter. And I'm sure that Elijah is wanting God to show up in a big miraculous way right now. Deal with Jezebel, you know, make her have some, some disease, some sores, make, make, her, make her die in this way. You know, he wants God to show up in a miraculous thing. So when God reveals himself to Elijah, there's a massive windstorm and it tears rocks loose. And I'm sure when that started, Elijah's like, all right, here he is. I remember the fire. Here he is, this big windstorm. Here's God. But God wasn't there. And then there's an earthquake, and I'm sure Elijah's like, all right, here we go. It's the big miracle. I'm ready. And it comes and goes, and God's not there. And then there's fire. And if I were Elijah, I'd be sitting there saying, all right, God, this is, this is how I last saw you show up. This has to be you. This has to be your presence. And God's not in the fire. God is in a gentle whisper. Because in that moment, what Elijah needed to understand is that God does not always move in some big miraculous way. What Elijah needed was his expectations to be shattered in that moment. And instead, he shows up in a whisper. And what I love about a whisper, you have to be close to hear a whisper. You can't stay at a distance. You can't sit back in the cave and hear a whisper. You have to draw in close to God to hear that. And Elijah has an opportunity to be changed. But unfortunately, even after this encounter with God, this, this miraculous thing on the mountainside and this whisper that speaks to him, Elijah seems to still be hanging on to that unhealthiness. Because what does God do? God asks him the exact same question again. What are you doing here, Elijah? He's getting a second opportunity for a confession of just saying, I don't know, God. I'm falling apart. I need you. But instead... Elijah answers the exact same answer, verbatim, word for word, to how he answered God before that encounter. This is why I think that Elijah has been ruminating on these unhealthy thoughts for this whole time, because even a direct encounter with God didn't shake him free of this negative thinking. But God doesn't dismiss it and just be like, you little punk, are you kidding me? After all that, Instead, God gives him some tasks to go and do and, and some things that will help him change his situation. Not immediately, but in time. He anoints a new king over Israel, a new king of Aram, the nation to the north and east of Israel, and then anoints Elisha to replace him as the future prophet of God. And this is the end of this story. We spent four weeks on this. And the reality is... Um, Elijah goes and anoints the people God asks him to, and we, we don't really get a great little wrap-up to this story. It doesn't say, then Elijah was healed by God and back to his old self. Or Elijah met a really good therapist and things got better. Or because Elijah implemented these new habits, he didn't struggle with his mental health ever again. And I, I actually kind of love that about the story. If you've ever struggled with your mental health, you know that it doesn't always just get fixed in, in a single moment. And maybe you've spent time praying and praying and praying, years praying. I want to challenge you, don't stop praying. Keep praying for a healing. But there are times where God puts us in a place where we, and we need, to, we need to take some healthy steps. We know as Christians, life doesn't always have the perfect ending. But we, knew, we do know that the ultimate ending has complete healing of everything that is broken in this world. Our job is to focus on God, to move in that direction, to try and find healing in, in our lives while we're here, to pray for that, to do other things, to help others around us find healing so that they can, they can live that life and, and never give up on this. We have this temporal hope that things can be made right here and now but then we also know that things will be made right in what is yet to come. And that's great. 
That's great. So what do we do with all this right now in our life? All right, and, and I want to I wanna finish up with just three steps for us. And this is going to go quick. That I think basically we're going to wrap up the whole series right here. If you've been sitting here, you've been listening to this series, uh, maybe you caught some of them online and, and, and you've tried to catch the ones that you've missed. Uh, this, this is, I think, how we need to wrap this up right here so that we can move further in our life and say, okay, I'm not going to let this I'm not going to let this control me. All right, so the first one is this. We need to be aware of where our mental health is at and the effects that our lifestyle has on it. That's what we spent a majority of this series doing, was talking about these different issues that we face with fear and isolation and comparison and, and our physical health and all these different things. Rumination, all of that basically is us trying to be aware of, okay, where am I at in my mental health? We've done a few tests in, in different weeks of saying, okay, grade yourself in these areas. Where are you at? And how is your life and your habits and your choices affecting where you are at? This is something that we, we, need, to, we need to be aware of. All right, and if this were easy to take care of, if I could easily give you one, two, three, go do this, we would not have a mental health epidemic right now in our world. But we do. So you know that this takes work. It doesn't just happen easily. So we learn about mental health in general and, and our own. We try to be aware where we are in the certain seasons where things are going to be better or worse. Are there certain things that push you into a negative, unhealthy space? Are there current habits or things in your life that, that, that are harming you? All right, the second thing. We need to have a strong desire to actually see change in our health. And begin to take those necessary steps. Because you can know where your mental health is at. And you can know what impacts you negatively. And you can just keep doing that. You can keep living that life. And the reality is most of the time when you're not in a good space mentally. You do keep living that life. I've had this conversation with people. Yeah, I know I should be getting out of bed. It's not that easy. Don't tell me, just, you know, swing your legs over the edge and put one foot down at a time. Like, there, there are moments where it's like, this is difficult. I am struggling with this. I know what I need to do. Having the actual, you know, determination and grit and discipline or whatever, whatever you want to call it. I don't, I don't even like using those words. It makes it sound like, you know, mental health just happens when you're undisciplined in life. And that's not true. But it, it's more than just knowing what you need to do. It's actually having that, that desire that I think comes from more than just us. This godly desire to move in this direction and take those necessary steps. God wants to help you walk to a healthier spot. But if we don't have that desire, if we don't take the necessary steps, if we allow the unhealthiness to reign supreme in our minds and in our life, then we cannot expect God and his peace to reign supreme. There's only one thing that can reign supreme in a life. That's how it works. We have to have this desire. And maybe that means seeking professional help. I've had so many good conversations in the last four weeks of people saying, hey, do you know where I could get in? I need to be seeing somebody. I'm realizing that. Do you know where I can get in? And the reality is, unfortunately, right now it's a long waiting list because we have so many issues going on in our world. But get on that waiting list if that's what you need to do. Maybe it's even, uh, it's getting onto certain medications that are going to help you. The first week we talked about this idea of the baseline that moves versus just our health and how that moves a lot quicker through different things. The baseline, maybe you need to get into a therapist and maybe you need to get onto certain medication and that's going to help restore your baseline to a healthy spot where now you still have to actually put in the work. Like I've known people where uh, they have ADHD and they get on a medication for it and they're like, great, now everything's perfect. You're like, no, now you're back to square one. That's, that's the purpose of this. Now you need to develop the life skills to move forward here. Like that, that's what those are meant for is, re is restoring that baseline to a healthy place. It's taking steps in basic areas like sleep, eating, drinking, exercise, the screen time that you have. It's taking every thought captive. It's surrounding yourself with people who will speak life into you. It's continuing to grow in this knowledge and awareness. 
Lastly, the last thing that we need to do in this, and this is by far the most important one, we need to rely on God in every single step of this process. At first I had this worded as we need to include God. No, that's not enough. We need to rely on God in every single step. Now I want to say this quickly. This means we rely on God the Father, on Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father, we get this, this picture of a patient, loving, caring Father that draws us into his presence. We can be honest about our feelings. We can cry out to him and he won't be mad. I kind of get this picture. Uh, I've seen it in so many different movies or TV shows over the years where someone is given news uh, of someone that they love passing away or dying. And you see them begin to grieve in this moment and the emotions are coming out and I can just, I can picture this, you know, where they're basically, they're standing there with the person that maybe has told them and they, they basically just start to kind of like hit that person. They're just pounding as they're crying and saying, no, 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 it can't be. And that person just stands there and takes it and just kind of hugs them and just says, it's okay, I got you. And I get that picture of God, of this same thing, where like when things are going on in my life, that it, God is big enough for us to come to him, even, even if we're upset and it's, it's just us kind of basically mad and upset and kind of pounding on God's chest and be like, what is going on? Why did this happen? Why, why am I still going through this? And God just, with this big loving embrace, saying, it's okay. It's okay, I got you. Sometimes when things are rough and not going well, we, we just need a little bit of that fatherly embrace. We need Jesus in this, the member of the Trinity that understands our pain and our hurt. He went through betrayal. He went through pain. He went through torment. Hebrews says this, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. We will find grace to help us when we need it most. We can approach Jesus like a friend who has gone through the same struggles we have because he has. We don't need to be ashamed of what we're going through. We bring it to him. And we need the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit. But in fact, it is better for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. In this translation, it says advocate, but the Greek word there, uh, paraclete, it means comforter, encourager, counselor. And that sounds like the Holy Spirit is exactly who we need in these moments. Comforter, encourager, counselor. And the Holy Spirit is a personal being, just like God, just like Jesus. They've all been around for, for eternity. God didn't make Jesus and then the Holy Spirit. Or the Holy Spirit isn't some impersonal force. Like this, this is, we, we need God. And when I say that, I think that it can be healthy for us to realize that we need all of God. We need the triune God. We need every one of his characteristics, every one of the things that he can do in our life. And we need to rely on him every single step of the way in our mental health. Let's stand together. As we close this series today, maybe, maybe you need to go back and listen to some of the ones you've already listened to or something. Maybe you need to spend more time digging into this. Maybe you need to just allow God to speak to you. You know, wh where are you at in this? You know, of these three steps that we had at the end. If you need to be growing in this awareness, you need to be, uh, you need to, understand where you are at. Maybe you've never thought about this. Maybe life has been really hard lately and you don't really understand why. Why is it so difficult for me? Why am I always upset with the people around me? Why am I always short with the people around me? What is going on? And maybe you need to just slow down for a second, take a step back and say, okay, obviously my mental health is suffering and I need to realize that. And then you need to begin to, to pray and work on some things and say, God, I, I need a desire to see change. I need a desire that will overcome every single hurdle and obstacle in my way. I need your strength, not my strength, because I've tried to do it in my strength. My strength, I can't get out of bed. But I know that in your strength, I can move forward. 
And as we begin to walk through just these seasons, and, and mental health is a bit of a roller coaster at times, for some people more than others. I know for me, we're going into the winter time here, it's gonna be a lot harder. It just always has been for me. And, and one of the things that Emily and I started doing is, is we've started planning things out through our winter, putting things on the calendar that we look forward to because in Minnesota, you need something to look forward to in the winter time. And I'll tell you what, just having something once a month, you know, you hit a new month, and you're like, oh, it's right. In the middle of this month, we're gonna go and do this. At the end of this month, we're gonna go and do this. This is happening. Like those little things just kind of help you. It's these little breadcrumbs that move you further down the trail. I want to I wanna just pray over us. I want you to take time this week. Just be thinking about this. Where am I at? Where am I at in this? How can I take a step forward? And God, I, I, I need you every single step of the way. Every single step of the way. God, we pray that we would just, we'd be able to come up open and honest to you. God, if that's something that we've struggled with before, maybe we struggle with this idea of transparency, not just with you, but the people around us. God, we try and constantly just put on a mask and pretend like everything's good. God, I pray that we'd be willing to remove that mask, to be vulnerable, to be transparent. If things aren't going good in our life, that we would admit that. God, that we would understand that in moments it's okay to not be okay. And to say that and, and to, to realize that. Because God, then, then we're in that place where we can begin to move forward with you. Jesus, we pray that we would turn to you as that friend that understands what we're going through. That has suffered. That has walked this earth in a human body just like us. Jesus, that we would come to you and Holy Spirit, that you would bring your peace, your comfort, your encouragement, the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, that we would just begin to rely on you in every single step of this process. We ask this in your name. Amen.